I want to welcome everybody to today's um, service, amen. And I believe this message is actually for the body of Christ at this time, amen. One thing I realize is this. When you speak about truth or about what is real, it is not dependent on the person that is experiencing it. Amen. It's not because a, a truth or reality does not depend on how you feel about a certain phenomenon or a certain thing. Amen. You might not understand something does not mean it's not true. Amen. But in the church today, we see that that's not the same thing. Because if I tell you that, um, um, do I really understand how this mic works? I, not really. I might have some idea how it works. Imagine I speak to just a very small knob here and my voice is amplified on the speaker. We turn on that little switch at the wall, the lights come on. Do we really understand fully how it works? No. But we know it is real. I don't really know how radio wave works, but I know if I pick up my phone, call my brother all over in Nigeria, he's going to pick up the phone. How we can do that Yes, they say physics behind all that, but I might not be able to understand or comprehend it fully. I pick up Skype or I pick up whatever, uh, you know, media, video device. I Skype my brother and we talk face to face, real time. I might not really understand, amen, but it is real, amen. Likewise today, many of us, there are so many things we are able to comprehend in the world, but we don't want to translate it into the spirituality. Many people walk into church and hear people speaking in tongues. Hear people saying, oh, I was healed. And they said, it's not true. It's a lie. I was there. I was praying myself. But I didn't feel anything. Yes, or perhaps I prayed. And I have this sickness in my body. And it didn't go. Then that means it's not true. Because you don't really feel it, because you don't really understand it, does not mean it's not true. Amen. I pray God himself will help us in Jesus' name. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Jude, verse 10. Amen. Let's read Jude, verse 10. Jude only has one chapter. Jude, verse 10. It said, But these people scoff at the things they do not understand. Like unthinking animals. They do whatever their instincts tell them. So they bring about their own destruction. These people scoff at things they do not understand. I don't really understand Skype, I don't really understand WhatsApp, but none of us scoff at them. But when it comes to the things of God, we tend to look at them and we say, it can't really be true. How can one man who died over 2,000 years ago, how can you tell me that his sin and his blood has covered every man's sins on, on, in, the, in the world? Amen. It's a mystery, but yet many of us, are, we are willing to, to, to accept the things we, can, we might not be able to rationalize physically. But when it comes to spiritual things, we tend to disregard them. Amen. But I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. Yes, we might not see God here right now. You might not see him behind me. I wonder why people always assume that God is always in the altar. That's not true. Amen. God is actually with you. Amen. He's always with you. Many of us always presume that the altar is special. We should preserve the altar. Yes, in the Old Testament, God usually resides in the oldest of oldies. But does not mean God is not with you. Amen. Right now, he lives in our heart. Jesus Christ said, whosoever obeys the Father. My Father, me and my Father, we make our home with Him. Amen. And we shall be with Him and sup with Him. So it's with you. Yes, you might not really understand all that concept. But let me tell you, God is real. Amen. And I pray He will make Himself real to us in Jesus' name. And if you ask yourself, you're not the only person that is going through these things. Amen. For you to question the, the validity of, the, of God's word. Or to even, to, to even think at times. At times some of you, some people actually sit down and say, is God really true? Not because you're a sinner. Not because you have gone out of the way. But at times you sit down and you really want to rationalize if these things are really true. Let's open our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. This was a story of a man. His name, uh, we, I'm not so sure if he's um, Gehazi, but it was, uh, we believe he could be Gehazi because that was the next um, servant of Elisha. He said to he woke up one morning, he saw the army, the enemies that came against them. And he told his master, I, I'm, we are afraid. It's, these people are here. And Elisha, Elisha said, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. But he's, he's looking around. It's just me and you. And how can you say two is more than a thousand. It's more than ten thousand. It's more than fifty thousand. But when Elijah prayed in Second Kings chapter two verse nine, he said, "When they when they had crossed, Elijah said, oh, 
um, sorry, that's not the passage I wanted to read. Amen. That's um, 2 Kings 6, 17. Second, sorry, 2 Kings 6, 17. Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened his servant's eyes. Then he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. They were there before, but he did not see them. Because he did, he did not see them does not mean it's not there. Amen. But many people always assume, if I can't see it, if I can't, if I can't see it, if I can't feel it, if I can't hear it, if I can't taste it, if my first five senses cannot have any interaction with it, then it is not real. But reality is beyond what your five senses can tell you. There are times you, you, you barely even hear your heart beat. Do you want to tell me you're dead? You're still alive. You might touch your heart and you might not hear, really hear any pounding. Does not mean it's not working. Amen. It's there. You might not really know how your intestines and everything work. But if you want to try it, go and sell it in the market and see if you're going to survive the next day. It's there. Amen. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. And there are many of us, even in the church, let's even leave the unbelievers alone this time. This message is for the church. I can tell you that so many people in the church who are not saying it out, but in their minds, they're actually questioning the things of God. What comes from the pastor? What comes from God? I hear the question and say, can these things be true? I've, they've said it a thousand times that I'm going to get a job. God, where's the job? You told your servant to tell me that I will have children. We are the children. You told me that I will have plenty. And now you look back, all you, look, you see in your account is your account is red. How do you correlate those two things? How do you uh, merge seeing God said you live in plenty and right now you are actually in abject poverty? How do you reconcile those two messages? And I can tell you in the church many people are actually thinking, God, is it really true you spoke? If you read 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 9, Elisha asked Elijah one thing. He said, let me receive the double portion of your anointing. And if, as a, um, as a um, Bible study um, student, you, if you count all the miracles of Elijah, there were 16. So double portion should be how many? 32. But Elisha had 31. The day Elijah, Elisha died, the day he passed on, he had 31. Will you tell me he has received the double portion of the anointing of Elijah? No. But yes, he might not really understand what God was doing. But even in his death, God brought to pass the last miracle. Let's open our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 21. 2 Kings 13, 21. So, he, uh, so Elijah, who already died, had 31. He was hoping to have 32. Now let's see the second uh, miracle, even when he thought he was already dead. Amen. Once while, once while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. So they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. When the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life and stood on his feet. Amen. The 32nd miracle came to pass even when the man died. If God has said something to you, I can be so sure. Let me tell you, he can take it to the bank. Even if the earth and heaven has to pass away for it to come to pass, it will come to pass. Job prayed. He said, Father, let the day which I was born be erased from days. And God made sure it was so. God erased the day of um, Job, the day he was born, he erased it from the calendar. How did he do it? He took um, 23 hours and 20 minutes from the days of um, um, jo from Joshua. Joshua pronounced and said, let the sun stand still and let the moon stand still. For about a day, 23 hours and 20 minutes, the sun stand still, stood still and the moon stood still. That was the day that was almost missing. And the, the remaining 20 minutes were removed when Ezekiah prayed. Ezekiah said, oh God, you know I've broken all those things for you. How can I die? And what did God do? God said, okay, I will make the sun go back 10 down. 20 minutes of time will be erased. So a whole day that uh, um, Job prayed and said, God, let that day be erased, was actually erased. If God has to bend physics to make sure your, uh, your miracle come to pass, it will come to pass. Mary said, I do not know a man. How can these things you've said be? What did the angel tell him? You don't need a man. But the Holy Spirit himself will overshadow you. And you'll bear forth a child. Let me tell you, there's nothing as hard as you telling me, 
Because let me tell you, if, a, if God forbid, a woman comes or my child comes, I say, Daddy, I'm pregnant. I'm like, who is Daddy? And she told me, there's no man. You won't believe it, I'm not going to be angry at her getting pregnant anymore. Now I'm angry at her telling me a lie. Why? It is impossible for one person, single-handedly, without meeting a man to be pregnant. Because all I will be telling her is, please, just, I beg you, just tell me the name of this man. I'm not going to hurt him. I'm going to give him gifts. Just tell me the name of the man. Because I know it is impossible for one person to have a baby. But yet, God did it. Amen. And I pray that every promise that God has given unto us, that the God of heaven will cause them to come to pass in our life in Jesus' name. That even if the heavens and the earth have to pass away, all, all the natures itself has to be bent on our behalf. That God will bend them on our behalf in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11. 2 to 3. Matthew 11, 2 to 3. John the Baptist, who is one of the greatest men that lived on earth, spoke about Jesus Christ. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Right? Then now let's read Matthew chapter 11. He said, When John was in prison, heard about the deeds of Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one to come or should we expect someone else? Amen. Imagine, he hears about the deeds of the Messiah and yet he was still asking, are you still the Messiah? Why? If you are the Messiah, why should I still be in prison? If you are really the person I pronounced that God told me you are, why should I still be in my own problem like this? I expect you to, to help me and get me out of this. But what did Jesus Christ tell him? Which I'm going to tell every one of us. This message is for both me and everyone in the church. This message is for everyone who is waiting for God for something and it seems as if it's not going to come. And this message is for those, some people might not see it now, but let me tell you, at one point in your life, there will be fire, there will be water. So perhaps, if you're not going through anything right now, this message is for you to put in your bank and the day it shows up, you say, God, I remember you said that I should not fret. Amen. Jesus Christ told him in verse 6 of Matthew chapter 11, he said, are you, uh, he said, blessed is the one who does not stumble on the account of me. Blessed is the one who does not stumble on the account of me. That means John would have almost stumbled because he thought, can this be the Messiah himself? Because he believed that, yes, God is God. He should be the one to restore me back, to take me out of jail, to restore me to my position as, as his one of his servants. But I'm still in this same situation. Why? Amen. Believers, saints, children of God, the word from God, we need not to fret. Yes, God has spoken, but we need to hold on to God and not look at what our eyes can see or perhaps what we can feel or what we can smell, what we can taste, but rather we should say, God, we believe on you. Amen. Before I even go into this teaching itself, I will ask myself, why do you think this this kind of feeling is beginning to manifest in the church. The feeling that is God lying. And the topic today is actually when God seems like a liar. You believe it, when I wanted to study for this message, I wanted to change this topic in many, many times. But something keeps bringing me back to stick to this same topic. When God seems like a liar. Because, you know, it seems like a disrespect to even assume in your mind that God is a liar. But despite it seems like that, many people see God like that. They might not say it out, but many people in the church, I'm not talking about outsiders, at this point are thinking that this Christianity is just a fable. I like it because it's a good thing to do, it's nice to do, but they can't really, because they can't reconcile what they are experiencing and what is being preached in the Bible. Amen. So today we're going to look at how do you think that feeling came about? And there are two things that is actually responsible. Well, there are many things, but we're going to look at two. One of them is this, the emerging culture, the new emerging culture. Today, everything is microwave age. Amen. Two minutes, I want my food ready. Those days, if you want to eat chicken pot pie, it will take you a whole day to make chicken pot pie. Why? You have to look for the chicken, kill the chicken, cook the chicken, then now use the chicken, then now start baking it. Whole day to have chicken pot pie. But today, I want to have chicken pot by, I have it frozen up in my freezer, I put it in my microwave, in less than three minutes, it's ready, and I'm eating chicken pot pie. Amen. It's easy as pie. 
Today, you want to have a birthday, you don't have to, I remember those, those days when my mom wants to do, um, when someone wants to do the birthday, my mom has to spend days and hours trying to prepare for the cake. Today, all you need to do is walk into Safeway or walk into Costco, tell them I like this cake, write the name on it, you take your cake, you're out. Today, nobody waits for anything. I remember when my father-in-law would tell me the story of how he got his first car in the 70s. It took him months. He ordered the car, the car took him months to get to him. Today, I want to get a car, what do I need to do? Walk into the dealership, point the car, or even call in my house, online. Call, the car is right there. You're not gonna wait for it for another day. It's gonna be right there. The culture itself is changing. Waiting is no longer what people want anymore. Today, everybody wants now, right now. I remember those days when we used to call. If you send a text, the text, the email might not get there till hours later. Today, you won't believe it, as soon as I send the text, as soon as I press send, I'm asking that person, have you gotten the text? Or have you gotten the mail? Nobody wants to wait any second longer. Amen. And that same culture, that same attitude is creeping into the church. We want a microwave God, a, a drive through God. Today, people don't even want to walk in again and make their orders at the, at the counter. Can I just call in and skip, call, skip the dishes, place my order and skip the dishes, and you can actually watch the meal getting close to you. The, as this meal gets in front of your house, you see the car parked right there. All you just need to do is walk to the door and say, my meal, amen. It's easy. The Bible said, let's read um, Luke chapter 24, verse 49. Luke 24, verse 49. Jesus Christ said, I'm going to send to you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been floated with the power from on high. Jesus Christ, the things of God are not the same with the things of the world. In the things of the world, you don't have to wait, but in the things of God, the Bible says you have to wait. Tarry in Jerusalem till you are filled with power. But today, that same spirit of that emerging culture of right now is coming in. And that's why nobody wants to wait anymore. The second reason why these things are happening in the church is for excessiveness. Now we have pastors and we have preachers, we have teachers who preach one side of the gospel and fail to preach the other. Amen. And then tell you that in itself is bad. When you preach on one and you fail to preach the other, you're, you're making it imbalanced. And that's what people are now confused. Today we are preaching a God who can do things instantly. And I can tell you, God is a God who can do things instantly. I've witnessed God do things instantly in my life. God, I want a parking spot right now. I'm driving to the parking spot and somebody's driving out and I drove in. Some people might say, oh, that's just coincidence. Whatever you call it, it was instantaneous to me. God, I have a headache. Heal me of this, oh Lord. I got healed. God, I'm feeling very sick. I took Holy Communion. That actually happened on Monday. I, I felt very sick and I took the Holy Communion. I ate it and I drank the Communion and I felt well. I told myself I would do the fast that day. But because I didn't want to eat, that's why I didn't want to do anything. But I took the Holy Communion, I ate it, I drank it. I felt well. That's one part of God healing you instantaneously. But when people begin to focus so much on that and, begin, and also fail to tell people it's possible for you to pray and yet <laughs> not even see the, 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 the result at all. Not even see it close to you. It's possible also. It does not mean God has failed you. It just shows that God is telling you to wait. Habakkuk chapter 2 it said, though the, uh, the vision is for an appointed time, wait for it. Do it tarry, it will surely come. Don't run away. The Bible said, if the anger of a ruler rises up against you, do not leave thy post. Stand firm where you are. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 10. Amen. So yes, people preach the instantaneous God, but they also fail to preach the God who can tell you to wait. And because of that, everybody is now thinking that, oh, my miracle did not come, then God does not like me. Perhaps I've done something wrong. You have not done it. If you have not done anything wrong, let me tell you, God can tell you to wait. Did Abraham do anything wrong to wait for 25 years? No. Did Job do anything wrong to go through all he did, he went through? No. But yet he went through everything. Amen. And this is where we ask ourselves, before we even begin to imagine in our head that perhaps God's word is a lie, or perhaps what I've been experiencing in the church is not true. We need to ask ourselves two questions. Before you even begin to say, I don't believe this Christian thing anymore. Because I can tell you many people are living in Christianity by their dozens. In Quebec right now, they're selling churches to, 
to turn churches to pubs. Churches have been turned to pubs. We went to um, Buffalo in 2000 and I don't remember. 15, 16, 2014. A whole, a big cathedral, empty for sale. A huge cathedral. And honestly, I, I tell myself, why can't I be able to buy these things very cheap and transport it to Canada? You know, but it's not possible. I mean, you can't ship a whole house, a whole cathedral. But imagine, that means before they can sell a church, that means nobody's coming to church. When nobody's coming to church, how do they have money to fund it? They can't fund it anymore. A whole church for closed. And now, just waiting there, barren. And I can tell you the reason why, it's not because people don't really, it's because people are not, they, today people are feeling your heart. Perhaps this God is not true. Some people tell you, oh, my mother prayed every day, but she died of cancer. God was very bad. Some people tell you, oh, my dad has always been a faithful follower of Christ, and yet he died in an accident. God was very bad. He must never liked me. And because of that, I'm not going to serve God anymore. Does that mean you're not going to serve God anymore? No. But perhaps before you go into that, let's, let's look at those two things we need to do. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, it said, examine yourself if you are still in the faith. You only feel the test if you are reprobate. Amen. This is where I want, before you can even begin to say God is not true, or perhaps all these things about Christianity is a lie, I want you to begin to ask yourself some questions. Amen. And the first thing is this. You need to ask yourself, have I sinned? Or do I have any sort of unbelief in my heart? Amen. God is a loving God, but let me tell you, God cannot withstand sin. If you read the book of Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13, it said, Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Yes, a man of God might say, yes, I've seen God face to face. Moses saw the back of God, the only man alive to see the back of God in the flesh. But because of his anger, because of not acknowledging God when he ought to, he did not enter the, uh, the promised land. So don't think anyone is too big. You are, the first thing you need to ask yourself, this promise that God has given to me, is it because I have sinned? Is it because of unbelief? The book of James chapter 1 from verse 6 to 7, he said, A man who doubts is like the wave of the sea that gets tossed back and forth. And such man should not think he can receive anything from God. The first thing is this, you need to ask yourself, do I have any sin in my life that is hindering God's goodness? Do I have anything in my life that the enemy is pointing to and say, you cannot bless him because of this? The Bible said in the book of Isaiah, it said, your sins, your, it said his hands are not too short to, he, to deliver you, and that is here too heavy to hear you. But your sins have created a big gulf between you and God. Amen. As Christians, we need to understand God cannot tolerate sin. So ask yourself, I want you to be honest. Let me tell you, no one can tell you where you stand with God today. I'm the only one who know how I'm standing with God. Will I, will, if that trumpet sounds today, will I go? I'm the only one that know, I'm God. Because let me tell you, no matter what you see on the outside, but Bible also said, by the fruit we shall know them. It's a standard which you live as Christians, but there's some things in your heart, some hidden things. Do you have those things in your heart? That's the first one. The second thing is this, is it the devil? Amen. If you read the book of Daniel chapter 10 from verse 10 to, from verse 12 to 13. Daniel prayed. The Bible said from the first day Daniel prayed, what happened? God heard him. But the prince of Persia would tell that prayer for 21 days. So the first thing is this. God spoke a word to you. Check yourself. Is it sin? If it's not sin, then now go to the next stage. Is it the devil that is standing against my blessing? All the devil wants to do is to create a confusion between you and God to make you feel like God does not love you and that's why he withhold it and if a man if let me tell you if somebody withhold your blessing and you makes you feel like oh, this person does not love me then it brings a confusion I'll give example let's say my wife cooks and I tell my wife can you um, get me juice and she sends the son go give daddy juice and the boy on the way drank the juice came to sit next next to dad and didn't say anything about the juice what do you think I would do I'll be angry that mom did not send the juice. But has the juice not been sent? Well, somebody drank it on the way. Amen. It's possible that God sent your blessing. But somebody is injuring it. Because you are not, you don't, you are not all knowing. You didn't know that somebody is injuring it. Now you have some resentment against the person that you sent, that you asked for. Amen. And that was what the devil did. 
But, David, but Daniel kept praying. Amen. And that's why the Bible ad, uh, admonishes us in the book of Mark chapter 3 verse 27. It said, if a man will loot the ass of a strong man, what do you do? You must first bind the strong man. Let me tell you, this world is of the devil. To receive anything good in this world, you must resist the devil. Amen. The Bible said in the book of Ephesians 6 verse 12, it said, Our wrestle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers. We don't wrestle against our boss. When you say, oh, I didn't get that promotion. It's not your boss that is standing against you. Deal with the devil. When you, um, you and your wife or you and your husband are having co conflict, let me tell you, it's not your husband or your wife. It's the devil. You need to stand against that and rebuke it. Amen. And so you, just, you, don't, you need to look beyond all what you're seeing with your eyes. Our wrestle is not against flesh and blood. Amen. And also the Bible said in the book of James chapter 4 verse 7, it said, Submit yourself to the Lord and resist the devil. And he will do what? Flee from you. Amen. Two things you need to check before you start telling yourself, is God really true? Is, have I sinned? Do I have unbelief? The second thing is this, is the enemy resisting my prayers? Amen. If these two facts are, are out of the way, then we can start talking. Then we cannot go proper into the message. Amen. If you read the book of Numbers chapter 23, God said, it's not a man that he should lie. Neither is son of man that he should repent. I can tell you it is impossible for God to, to, to lie. If you read the book of Hebrews, let's have it on the screen. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18. The Bible said, of two immutable things, of two unchangeable things, some other versions will say, God cannot lie. Let me tell you, no matter what God can do, God cannot lie. That was why he said he, he honors his word more than his name. If God says it to you, you are so, so sure it will come to pass. If the heavens and the earth will have to pass away, God will bring it to pass. He must do it. God cannot lie. That was why the Bible said, if you read, if you read um, the Amplified Version of that, uh, Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18, it said, when God was going to make the promise, he made a promise, both the promise and the covenant, because he, those two things, he cannot change them. He made an oath, and he made a promise. And it's, by those, those two things, God cannot lie. He has given his word, he cannot lie. Amen. And I pray God himself will show himself to us in Jesus' name. Because, and I can still, that's why we know that, that God cannot lie. But at times, it still seems to us that God has lied to us. You know, in, at the beginning of the year, you hear a word and they tell you, this year, God will change your testimony. Amen. And at March and at August, you sit telling yourself, God, it is August. The testimony is not, it's not even changed. It's even getting worse. What is going on? Amen. And this is where we want to balance the message. Amen. Today, and I pray in, in 10 minutes, God will grant me the, 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 the tongue of a learned to speak expressly. Amen. That I will be able to speak well in Jesus' name. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Georges, chapter 20. I don't know why we wear suit in church when it's hot like amen pastors are they punish themselves amen amen judges chapter 20 please write down verse 12 to 48 12 to 48 or perhaps read the old judges chapter 20 i because of our time i'm not going to ask us to read everything but at some passages i wanted to note down you can write down verse 18 verse 23 and verse 28 so I'll give you a background of the story. A man is a Levite. He's a Levite. He went to pick up his, um, his um, concubine from her father. They traveled back to a place. And the men in that city, in, in the city of Benjamin, and raped the woman till she died. It's in the Bible. Amen. <laughs> they raped her till she died. Till the morning, all the men in the city, those men are very wicked, raped her till she died. But she was very, I like this woman. She struggled till she got to the door post of the house, and that was where she died. She did not, you made sure she did not die in that place. She crawled to the front door, she died. And when the man saw that his wife is dead, his concomite is dead, he took her, took him, took her to his own place, cut her up into 12 pieces. This man also seems like a psychopath, amen. Cut the woman into 12 pieces and sent each part to the 12 tribes of Israel. What he was doing was this, he was touching their emotions. It has never been done in Israel before. This man has taught their hearts. Now the whole of Israel stood up as one and told Ephraim um, and said, um, um, told um, 
that give us this person that committed this act. The group of people who did this, summoned them to us. They refused. Now the whole of Israel said, if you don't give this man to us, these people to, to us, we're going to kill, we're going to fight you. And of course, they chose to say, let's fight. Amen. But before these people went to war, let's read verse 18, 23, and 28. They inquired from God. Amen. I'll read Judges chapter 20, verse 23. 23. He said that they're fighting against the Benjamites. 23. He said, The Israelites went up and wept before the Lord until evening and inquired of the Lord. They said, Shall we go up again to battle against the Benjamites, our brothers? And God said, go. That was actually the second one. The first one was in 18 where God told them that let uh, Judah go first. If you read verse 8, it said, The Israelites went up to Bethel and inquired of, of God and said, Who of us shall go first to fight against the Benjamites? Then God replied, Judah shall go first. God told them, Judah, go first. If you read verse um, 21, you can see how bad the Benjamites beat the whole of Israel. Yet God told them, go. We barely hear this passage in the Bible. People speak about that David who said, God, shall I go? Go. Will I recover? You will recover. Will I possess everything? Yes. And the Bible said, nothing that was taken from him was lost. But we failed, also failed to preach this passage where Israelites inquired of God and went to fight against their brother Benjamite. And a small one tribe against 11 beat them. Not just once, beat them twice. Even the, battle, the, even the victory they got on the third time was actually by power. If you read it, there was a time the Benjamites were pushing them so hard. And the Israelites were running. And the Benjamites were very happy that we are beating them now. Then before you knew it, there was ambush. Let me tell you, did these people not inquire from God? They did. And yet, they were beat two times. The third time, they actually were almost beat, but they got it by power. Amen. Let's read Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 18. Ezekiel 7, 18. The Bible said, It is not good to be overly righteous. Why die before your time? It's not good to be overly wicked. Why destroy yourself? He said, It is good to grasp one end and the other. Yes, we're preaching about God can deliver you right now. But also, we need to also hold the other hand that says that God can choose to say, I will do it when I want to. Let me tell you, your life is not, has not ended. The battle has not ended until you have ended. Until God says so. Even if we say ended, you know, we think that Elisha died. That is the end. That, well, was that the end for Elisha? No. So don't think that you have lost until, until it, you have really lost. Don't worry. Just let God determine when the last whistle is blown. Amen. Yes, we preach God who can make the miracle come right now. But we also need to know that there's a God who can say, I will wait. When you go through the water, he said, I will be with you. When you go through the fire, it will not harm you. Amen. I will be with you. This is where we need to balance both sides. Amen. And the first thing we need to do is this. Why many people actually assume that why is God not showing himself? Is that I can tell you we, are, we lack understanding of God's will. I myself that I'm standing here, I can tell you, I can only tell you a part. No one in the body of Christ can tell you it's all knowing. There's no one on earth. You can tell that to anyone. You can take this preaching and tell anyone that, yes, Abayomi said that there's no pastor on earth that's all knowing. Yes, there's no one that's all knowing. Let's open our Bibles to the book of um, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 12. I'll read the NLT version. So many people always assume that there's a, there's a pastor who knows all things. There's a pastor who can see like, like a dog. There's no one that knows all things. We all sing in part. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now we see things imperfectly. Paul speaking. A man who went to heaven in the body. A man who was caught up in the third heaven. And the Bible said the things he saw and the things he heard are indescribable. Are things that should not be said. Things that should not be repeated. Amen. This was a man who saw all those things. And yet, what did he say? I, we see things imperfectly like puzzling reflections in a, in a mirror. Then we will see everything with, with perfect clarity. 
But then we will see things in perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything complete, just as God knows me completely. In the end of time, when we all are raptured, when we are with the Lord, then we, will, we have the mind of God. At this time, we only know in part. Why is things happening to me? It's only in part. You have no idea. Amen. Understanding God's will is very, very hard. It's not. It's true that we are not encouraging people to be ignorant. But what we are trying to say is this: we are not all knowing. We are not God. Amen. Today there are so many who make it seem like we should, we should, or can understand every phenomenon on earth, every everything that happens on earth. We should be able to explain it. But that's not even scriptural. Amen. Jesus has said several times. Said the secret things are God. The things that are revealed are for us and our children. And also, if you read the book of Acts, chapter one, verse seven, he said, "It is not for you to know the times and dates the Father has set for His own authority. It's not for you to know. But yet, there are some people who speak excessively and tell the church that we should know all things. Let me tell you. Yes, the Bible said this, this, the mysteries. It is given unto us to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but we can know all things. Our head is too small. I always remember." Um, I remember when I went, to, I was in Catholic church with my uncle, and the father was speaking about um, Saint Augustus, how he was in, um, how he became a, a saint. He sat by the beach side, and was pondering about God and wanted to know more about God. And Saint Augustus, if you see Saint Augustus, his uh, uh, statue, he always has a baby. He, has, he, carries, he carries a baby in his hand, uh, baby Jesus. The I don't, know, I forgot that part of Jesus. So. Just, let's go on. So he sat by the beach side wondering about God. So he saw a child who dug a hole at the beach, at the beach and this child would go to the, to the ocean and take water and pour the water in the hole. He saw the child going back and forth. Now I called the child and said, come, what are you trying to do? I see that you have been doing, trying to put water. He said, the child I said, I'm trying to put all the water there in the ocean. I want to put it in this hole. Now told the child, that's impossible. The child and I said, that the same thing you're doing. You're trying to fathom God and put it in your brain. And the child disappeared. Either it's true, either it's not true, I can't really tell you, but I like that analogy because really you cannot fathom a whole God in your tiny brain. The brain of every man put together cannot fathom God. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things are God, the things that are revealed are for us and our children. Amen. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Human beings need to understand that things are beyond us. Amen. Also, if you read the book of Luke chapter 8, verse 17, the Bible said, For all that is secret will be eventually be made open in will be eventually be brought into the open. And everything that is concealed will be brought to light and made known. But at this time, we're just walking step by step. Now I look back and I realize that the things that I thought were mysteries to me 10 years ago have become a light. Honestly, I had a dream, uh, maybe I'm not going to do that today, but there are many things that I remember 10 years ago, I'm like, how is this going to happen? I remember when I first came to Canada, I, my first car was $700, not actually my own car, for myself and my brother, so we actually split the money. 350 350 we bought a $700 car. So I was one that was going to pick up the car at the dealer. And I remember walking up to the dealer's um, shop, and I saw 16700 on a car, I saw another 20000 something on a car, and 23000 something on a car. You won't believe it in my mind, I'm like, can I ever, ever in my, you won't believe it, I'm not joking, I'm not, in my mind, I didn't tell anyone, but I thought I would never be able to, to say I want to buy those cars. And I remember one of my friends, now he said, oh, he wanted to buy, he said, oh, about me, I want to buy a car. And I said, okay, oh, which one? He said, oh, I want to buy a Porsche McCann, you know. Uh, I think that's what I really want right now. I'm like, and I reminded him, I said, do you remember those days that we used to, when we want to search online, we'd be looking for, we'd say, you know, put max, we put 500 as max of car. At least we put zero, zero to 500, we'll be looking for cars. Now, you can say, God, I want 70,000. No, 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 I don't like that one. The, the, the back seat is too tight. Then, <laughs> the 700 dollar one. You believe I love it so much. But now I look back, I understand. How will I be able to move from $700 to a place where I can say, God, thank you? I thought it was impossible. But now I look back, I saw that God had his part in place. Amen. 
the first thing you need to understand why may, at times it, at times it makes God seem to be a liar is because we ourselves are limited in our minds and it's not that like God is trying to be wicked or mean our minds cannot comprehend fully the Bible, uh, Job, uh, Paul said the things he saw and the things he heard and and in and not permittable for man to see when um, John the beloved saw the throne of God let me tell you if, if, I, if you tell me that how should the throne of God look like do you think you're going to see a, a, a creature the Bible said there are four beasts that stand before God one had the face of a man one had the face of a lion one had the face of a uh, bull and one had the face of an eagle do you think they should be such creatures before God do you think they should be such creatures before God no, because in my mind I'm like, no, those, those should look ugly. Because if I find an animal that has the face of a man, ah, and I find another one that has the face of a lion, <laughs> I'm running away. And yet, those four creatures standing before God. The Bible said all their eyes, there, there's eyes all over them. Everywhere there's eyes. Imagine that there's um, somebody standing right now, and all over him is eyes. How will he look like? Very creepy. And yet, such creatures stand before God. But we can't fathom it. And that's why it God shows himself in the old way he is. Let me tell you, man will not be able to stand. Amen. The first thing we need to understand is God is unsearchable. God is beyond our, our searching. The Bible said in the book of Isaiah, chapter, um, Isaiah said, My ways are not to waste, neither am I taught your thoughts. He said, As the heavens are far from the earth. Do you know how heavens are far from the earth? So are my ways far from your ways. So are my thoughts far from your thoughts. Amen. When Job was going to question God, he questioned God. But when God was going to answer him, he didn't give him an answer. God, what did God do? He questioned him. If you really, uh, for those of all who want to study, go uh, read um, Job chapter 38, the whole of Job 38. But maybe for because of our time, let us just uh, project Job 38, 1 to 5. I'll read Job 38, 1 to 5 from here. 1 to 5. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, Who is that? Who is this that darkness cons that darkens my counsel with what without knowledge? Now he's speaking to Job. He said, Who is this? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimension? Surely you know. Who stretched out a measuring line across it? Amen. We have no idea how those things come to play. And yet we want to ask God, God, why is this happening to me? The Bible said that all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. I can tell you, if everything that you're going through is because God has a place for you. Somebody asked me once that if there's anything you want to change in your life, what will you change? I said nothing. And why? Because the, way, the place I am today, I'm very happy. And I will not change anything. Amen. Will I change my childhood? I love my childhood. I don't believe I love my childhood. Will I change the universities I went to? Today I am quite resilient the way I am because of the things I've seen, the things I've heard. My school is one of the most notorious schools in the year. Um, it was declared the second most notorious in the world in 1999, Ambrose Ali University. A place where in daylight there's in, in the air. Everybody's running away. One teacher collapsed died of a heart attack. A place where you can be sleeping. If, you have, if, if they have not shot in your area, don't go to bed because it could be your house. But if they have shot on that street, you are sure that the armed robbers have passed away. That means I can sleep tonight. And yet I graduated from, I remember when those things happen every day, I would say, this time tomorrow, if I don't leave this school, by, 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 by tomorrow, I will stay again. Amen. And today, when I hear people like, oh, this thing is freaking me out, I'm tired. I'm like, the things I suffered in Ekbomwa has made me who I am today. I mean, that's why I hear, you know, when some kids, you tell some kids, oh, uh, they say, oh, somebody insulted me. Even that's why before you insult me, I would give you 10 names I was called when I was a boy. I remember when I was a boy, people used to call me pickup. You know, they say my head looked like, uh, like a pickup truck. And that's why when people say they want to insult me, insult does not touch me in any way. Because I've heard so much that I, just, I, I even just go with it. And then you see, I was saying, oh, me, myself, I am there. Amen. And your kids cry over, oh, somebody called me this name. Yeah, I, I'm not saying that they should call anyone any name, but you know, I have built my resilience by the things I went through. The Bible said Jesus Christ has lent obedience by the things he suffered. Amen. 
I pray God we help us in Jesus' name. And I pray that every word which God has spoken to us, you will bring to pass. Yes, we might not understand, but I pray it will cause us to understand in Jesus' name. And also, the second thing we need to understand is this, God's sovereignty. Yes, we might not understand God because God is God, but also God can, is, is sovereign. He can choose to do whatever he wants to do without any question to any man. The Bible calls him in the book of Romans um, chapter 9 verse 21, he said, He's a potter. We are the clay. Does the clay tell the pot, uh, potter what to make him? No. It chooses to make him whatever he wants to make him. I'm going to give you an IQ of 200. Nobody will question him. I'm going to make you short. Nobody will question him. I'm going to make you fat. Nobody's going to question him. I'm going to make you whatever I'm going to make you. Nobody will question him. He has made you that way. You need to live with it. Amen. God is sovereign. Amen. He does everything he does without, without apologies. And this is where our true loyalty to God is tested in the, in the sovereignty of God. When, when we can't understand yet, we say, God, we don't understand, but yet I want to. I will surrender myself. Job said in the book of Job chapter 13 verse 15, said, Though he slay me, yet I will praise him. Let me tell you, it's easy for you to tell me you love me if everything is going well. If a true friend is born in the days of adversity, but the day you have plenty, oh, you have people to come and eat with you. Oh, everybody partying, drinking, they're all doing crack cocaine and doing everything. There, people will be there. But the days where you don't even have any money, you don't have anything, the person that stands by you is your true friend. Likewise, yes, people are receiving miracles all sides and they say, God, I love you. But you don't receive the miracle. And yes, you told them, yet I still love you. That is true love. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 21, verse 15. John 21, 15. Jesus Christ fed um, um, Peter, and he told Peter, he said, Peter, do you love me more than this? Can you say to God, I love you more than my wife, I love you more than my children, I love you more than my job, I love you more than my career? Or will you say, God, I only love my career. If you make my career well, then I will love you. Or do you love him? God's sovereignty, God, God and the, our, our, our understanding of God. Are those, are those two things that makes us at times sit down and say, God, are you really there? Amen. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. In conclusion, in all these things we've said, one thing is, is needed, and that is persistence. Faith is holding on to God when we do not even understand. Faith is believing on God and saying, God, I don't understand, but I'll keep doing it. You told me to go the first time, I will go the first time. I, got, I, I missed it, but I'll still go again the second time. I missed it, I will still go again the third time. The Bible said, a man who says, if a sluggard says there's this lion in the streets. So he does not do anything. The Bible said, either consider the rain, will not sow. Either consider the wind, will not reap. But like, so what we need to do as believers is to be persistent in our faith. God has said it to you, hold on to it. Prepare yourself. I heard of a story of a young lady that God told her she was going to travel out of Nigeria. She was very excited. I'm going to travel. Yay! Six months down the line, one day the pastor just called her and said, Oh, um, the U.S. Embassy are looking for some people with MBA to do some things. They need uh, um, your passport right now. Bring it so they can give it by Monday. And this lady said, I don't have a passport. Is she, really, is she really ready to travel? You want to travel, you don't have a passport. And yet you're telling yourself, Father, you're taking me out of Nigeria. And you're, the things you need to do before you leave Nigeria, you've not even done one. The first step is to even have an international passport. You've not done one. Perhaps what we're going through right now is God preparing us for what is to come. You, you're telling God, God, let me tell you, being a billionaire is not an easy job. It's easy, money goes faster than it comes. So if you think that um, I'm, when, I have, um, when I win a lottery and I have $1 million, it would go faster than you thought. If you cannot manage $10,000, sorry, $10,000, you cannot manage one million dollars. It's not a curse. So perhaps what you're going through right now is God teaching you to prepare yourself. Perhaps there's that nurturing thing you need to start to nurture. Perhaps there's that confidence thing that you need to begin to, to, to realize. I say, God, I believe on you. I, 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 I see myself as a father. I see myself as a nurturing person. I see myself as someone that is patient. I see myself as, as, as a man who can manage even a thousand dollars. I still live, I still survive. Amen. And I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. Jesus Christ called the woman, the Canaanite woman, he said, I have never seen such a faith in Israel. Why? Jesus, God, Jesus Christ told her that the bread is not for the dogs, and yet she was persistent. She said, even the dogs still eat 
from the father's table. Amen. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Lastly, let us open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, then we pray. Hebrews 10, 23. It says, let us hold unwaveringly to the hope we profess. For he who has promised is faithful. Is faithful. Let us hold on to that promise. What is that promise God has given to you? It might seem as if it is impossible, but let us hold on to it. Amen. And I pray God himself will help us in Jesus' name. I just want to do this by our heads. What is that thing that is making you doubt God? I want you to be honest with yourself. This is not a time for you to tell God sweet words. It sees your heart. It knows how you feel. Is it your career? Is it your life? And this message is actually in collaboration, is actually linked with um, when God seems distant. Perhaps if you really want to understand, listen to the, when God seems distant. And ask yourself today, God, what is it, O oh Lord, that is causing me, O oh God, to feel like you're not real to me? Is it that disease in your body? Is it that um, lack of job? Is it that delay in your childbearing? Is it that thing that you're looking on to say, God, will, when will it come to be your oh God? Today, I just wanted to pray. I said, Father of heaven, you did it to Job. You did it to Abraham. You did it to Isaac, to Anna, to Mary, the mother of Jesus. You did it to your disciples. You did it to the three Hebrew boys. You delivered them from the fire. Oh God of heaven, oh God, come and show your power in my life, oh Lord, in Jesus' name. And the grace to wait on you, even at this time. Give to me, Father God. That I will not, that my faith will not fail. My faith will not falter. My faith will not be, I will not be of them who go back onto perdition. And say, oh, God is not true. Father God of heaven, grant me the grace and the strength to be able to stand firm in Jesus' name. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are praying. Father God of heaven, O oh God, I stand as your servant, O oh God, in Jesus' name. And we, your children, have come unto you in all sincerity of our hearts. We know, God, there are many times, O oh God, we have felt like, God, you are distant to us. There are many times we have felt like men of God have lied to us. There are many times we have felt like perhaps we have misheard your promise. And, O oh God of heaven, we pray. You said the heavens and the earth, do they pass away, your word will not go on unfulfilled. I pray, God of heaven, that you will bring your word to pass in our life, O Lord, in Jesus' name. That word of healing, that word of expansion, that word of transformation, that word of, God of, of fulfillment on all sides. I pray, Lord God, let it be made manifest in our lives in Jesus' name. Even at this time, this way we might not really understand what is going on. The grace to remain steadfast and hold on to you regardless. For that grace given unto us in Jesus' name. The grace to say like, to say like the three evil boys, that even if he does not deliver us from the, fairy, from the fire, will not bow. That grace you give unto us, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you for all of the God, we give you praise. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have prayed. Amen.